Bibles to Matthew, and we are going to be in Matthew, but I wanted to um, go back over a section just for a time where we can apply these truths to our lives before we pray and get into where we left off in Matthew, and that's right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, we find this um, fruitful statements about life and I call it the two the two gates and the two ways that lead to the foundation of what you you have or do not have how's that and it's interesting to me that that the Lord in verse 13 of chapter 7 begins by saying there it, there is a narrow gate and there is a wide gate and a wide gate is, it, what sh shall I say, is inviting because you have a lot of room to come in. And yet a narrow gate is, uh, doesn't have that, does it? And some people may think, well, why didn't, he th why didn't he think up something that made the gate wide for Christianity? Uh, and I say it's because you're on a narrow path. There's only one way in. Yeah. Yeah. And there's only one path by which God says you are to walk. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's kind of like um, outside when we we're driving a car, you know. Everybody understands that you drive on one side as a general rule, right? <laughs> That's the way you have to do it. If you're going to land a plane, you 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 want the the captain to land exactly on the uh, runway for which he was told to run. Not, oh, I like to run, I just like to land on this one. It's a little bit easier. Yeah. You can't do that. That's the same way here that Jesus is speaking. Is that if you're going to get into following him, you must go through the narrow gate. And then he talks about. Uh, what kind of fruit you should demonstrate that you're not a false prophet or a, a false sheep. And he speaks about um, bearing good fruit. In other words, if you are a good tree, you bear good fruit. That doesn't mean people want to try to slice it and dice it that, yeah, but sometimes we sin and we don't produce the good fruit. I know, I know, but he's looking at the tree as a whole. Mm. If you look at the tree as a whole and you say, oh, that's bad fruit, you might want to check your testimony, whether it is truly a saving faith. Every, every tree, even good trees, right, have a few rotten parts of this, that, and the other, this, that, and the other, but you wouldn't say the tree is rotten. You would say it's fruitful because of the abundant fruit that it produces. We all have sin. And so, Amen. notice a, um, <clears throat> verse 20, he says, so then, so then you will know them by their fruits. And then he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now that caught my attention because uh, I'm in the commentary uh, that I'm writing on Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, which deals, says you must believe that Jesus is Lord. <laughs> and yet it says here, not everybody who says Lord, Lord mm -hmm. really know it. And uh, that ought to cause people to pause. Not necessarily that you should question your salvation, but just because someone says something. Well, this is, we need to look at some of the fruit, huh? over the long haul. So he's saying here, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. That must be part of the fruit, right? Mm -hmm. That he's speaking about. Many will say to me on, on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. They did not enter the narrow way. 
even though they were saying, Lord, Lord, even though they said they were casting out demons, performing certain things, and prophesying in his name. That, too, should cause a person to pause. What are we looking at? Should we be looking at the person's profession of faith and that which comes flowing from his life? And then he makes the application in verse 24. Therefore, mm. everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. So, all of this now has to be tied to what he's already specifically said mm -hmm. of trying to figure out who is fruitful and who is not, who is on the narrow way and who is not on the narrow way. And he says, if you are doing the will of the Father, you're going to have this kind of foundation. If you don't, this is what you're going to find. So he begins to talk about that a wise man who builds his house upon the rock and the rain descends and the flood came and the wind blew and burst against that, that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded upon the rock. So he uses a physical illustration to illustrate the life of an individual, a person. When the trials and the wind and the things burst upon his life, what kind of response does he have? If he's truly built his life upon the rock of Jesus Christ, though he may falter a little bit here and there, he will stand because he has a solid foundation. And then he says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like the foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. Then he again puts forth a storm, a flood, and wind, and the house will fall, and great will be its fall. The result was that when Jesus finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching, and he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. I guess so. <laughs> so, the question you need to ask yourself is what foundation are you building upon? And are we demonstrating that we are truly followers of Christ by when the storms come, when the wind blows in the sense of things that happen to in our life, do we have or have we placed our solid footing upon the solid rock, Christ. Are you building your life upon him? Now, sometimes Christians can have some sand in his foundation, can't they? That's not what this is talking about. Say that again. Okay. This is not what this is talking about. But sometimes a, a Christian has some sand in his foundation. Oh, okay. Because he's he is conflicted. He's part of the foundation this and part of it not. And therefore he becomes a very rocky Christian or a Christian who does not know the word or is not living the word. These kind of things. But that's not what this text is saying here. But I'm now making application to other things for which the foundation can be um, affected because though we are true believers, we're not basing our life upon the firm foundation of Jesus Christ and Him alone. Sure easy, isn't it? In a life to try to live life on the sand. Okay. Like fanning themselves. Everybody hot today? No, we're in the Baptist church. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know out of such conviction, you know. <laughs> So, shall we take heed to God, Jesus' word and apply it that we may be building our life upon the solid rock? I was 
Reading Psalm 62, and this brought this to mind, because Psalm 62 talks about God is my rock. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if Jesus might have thought about that. He's thought of everything. That's true. All right. What shall we do? We are still in Matthew and should be in Matthew for a while. Just wanted to remind you where we are. And exam that's coming up, right? And uh, that'll be good. We left off uh, at the end of chapter 9. And so we are now in chapter 10, but I want to uh, uh, remind you of the flow of the book of Matthew because it becomes important. It's often you are in books or you are reading passages, you get locked in on one section and, not, or, and do not have the thought of the entire flow of a book or a gospel. And so in Matthew and how he is arguing and how he's presenting things, it is becomes crucial for interpretation in certain areas and chapter 10 is one of them. Chapter 12 will be another. Chapter 13 will see a transition. So we need again to set the stage because what was happening in Matthew's time when Jesus was on earth is a little different than what we have today. And you say, well, what's the difference? That's why I'm saying what I'm saying. So let's look at it. In Matthew chapter 3, we see John the Baptist comes upon the scene and he has a message that is summarized when he says, um, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What is that kingdom? What is the kingdom for which, if you have studied the Old Testament, has been promised through the Davidic covenant? And that they were looking for the king to bring in the kingdom that was promised to the nation of Israel. And now the king comes upon the scene. And he makes, and he has a, an entourage, if you want to say. He has a, a one person that is blowing the trumpet, so to speak, <coughs> before he arrives, and that's John the Baptist. And his message, as he blows the trumpet to try to prepare people for this period of time, is repent, change your mind, make sure you follow this. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, if you read the Old Testament, you would, and you were a theological student of this Old Testament, you were following it through and to trying to understand it, not just in each individual verse, but the flow of what the Old Testament is trying to say you would come to the conclusion at the end of Malachi for our text, it's Second Chronicles in the Hebrew text, you would say, well, if from the garden of Genesis 3, you have promised that there be one who would come and take care of this problem. Not only that, you've given us an Abrahamic covenant that deals with a land, a seed, dealing with both one particular seed that would come, who would be a king, and there would be a kingdom with a bunch of seeds. In other words, who would be in the kingdom? Land, seed, and blessing. The blessing would be of the new covenant that he would die for our sins. That was unfolded throughout the Old Testament. But when you come to the end of the Old Testament, you would say, well, it, you've given a lot of promises, God. But I don't see any fulfillment of those promises. And so, for three, what was it? Uh, four, three to four centuries, 400 years approximately, there was no prophet. As, as though God was silent. And now he breaks the silent, silence by bringing John the Baptist and going, da 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 da, he's here. <laughs> 
The kingdom is near because the king is here. And of course what we're going to see is they miss the king. But right now, the kingdom is at hand because the king is here and he's such a king that he could bring in the kingdom at any moment. In chapter 4, the king now comes upon the scene and what does he say? Well, in verse 17, he says the same thing that John the Baptist said. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand because the king is here. And you'll see that the, uh, from 18 through 25 of chapter 4, he begins to bring forth proclaiming in every place in Galilee, verse 23, the gospel of the kingdom. And he was healing people. Why? That was a sign that the king was here and the kingdom was at hand. So, at this point in time, the kingdom is in play. In other words, the kingdom could come in because the king is presenting the kingdom. And yet what we're going to see as Matthew brings it out more than Luke is that the king is being rejected <clears throat> instead of accepted. You can see these things, especially in uh, chapter um, Nine, which we just finished, but I want to show you again. Um, it says in verse 34, he had uh, cast out a demon of a so-called dumb man who couldn't speak, and they marveled, and they, they said in verse 33, nothing like this was ever seen in Israel, but the Pharisees. We're saying he cast out the demons by the ruler of demons. That's pretty strong uh, going against something, huh? Instead of saying, yes, you are very God or very God, the king that is coming to bring the kingdom on this earth, he goes just the opposite, to Satan. You're of Satan. Now, what we have here is that Jesus was doing miracles to such a degree that no one could legitimately say that he, these were false miracles. He wasn't healing people who were having headaches or some kind of backache. He was healing people who didn't have arms and now they have arms. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? It was constitutional diseases for which no one would ever say he didn't do miracles. So if you couldn't say that he wasn't doing miracles, then you begin ad hominem attacks upon the character of who the person is. So yeah, he's doing miracles, but he's not doing them of God. He's not the Messiah. He, he must be of the devil, of Beelzebub. So the very one for the very God of very God, who's now very man, very man without sin, he is on earth doing these miraculous things, proclaiming that the kingdom is at hand, accept me as the king in the kingdom. And he's beginning, just like an old Texas thunderstorm as you see it coming, a building of opposition toward him. It's not just a one-time, um, I'm going against you, it, it, but we're, we're just going to be pointing out a few things that are constantly being put forth to a point where they resist and they reject and they reject and there comes a point in chapter 12 when something happens very big and we'll get to it, okay? But I point out here that they are now, the leadership of, of the nation is going against Jesus. Oh, of course, there were some in, that accept as the people but as the whole and the leadership, they're beginning to reject him. Verse 35 of chapter 9. And Jesus was going about all the cities and the villages and teaching in their synagogues. What? Proclaiming that the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of diseases and every kind of sickness. Why? That was a sign from the Old Testament. Read Isaiah 35, for example. 
that when the king comes, miraculous things would happen. What? To confirm who he is. And so, now they're going to have to say all these miracles are going to have to be from the devil because they can't deny the miraculous. There was too many of them. It was too such a high degree that they couldn't legitimately because they'd be laughed at. But the source of it? Maybe it came from the evil one. And that's what they begin to say. Idea came from okay? Now, in chapter 10, having summoned the 12 disciples, which we call, will be called the apostles in verse 2, he names who they are, and he gives them instruction. Notice verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter the city of the Samaritans, who were kind of half between, right? <coughs> half Jewish, half mixed in this, that, and the other. <coughs> but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 7. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist came and said it. Jesus now has been preaching ever with it. Now he says, okay, I need to make, I need to go to different places, so I'm going to take my dis disciples, my apostles now. They're going to take that message, and we're spreading it all throughout the nation of Israel. And then he instructs them like he was doing to heal the sick and raise the dead. What? To give confirmation that what they're saying is true. Then it gives them some instructions. In verse 10, um, uh, 9 and 10, do not require gold or silver or copper for your money belts or bag for your journey um, or even... Uh, tunics, or, uh, two tunics, or sandals, or staff, for the worker is worthy of his support. People ought to be able to take care of you. I will provide. And into and whatever city or village enter, uh, inquire who's worthy in it. Abide there until you go away. And as you enter the house, Greet, give it your greetings, and if the house is worthy, let your greeting of peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let it, you, your greeting of peace return to you. And whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words as you go out of the house or, or that city, shake off the dust <clears throat> off your feet. In other words, this is you are now confirmed in your unbelief. In a sense. All right? So, he says, truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Why? You've been given a great deal of life. I sent my people there. I, you, I proclaim my word and you reject it. Now, um, yes, so, I mean, the devil always has, he can never fully accept the truth un until Christ comes back. He True. has, the devil or evil in general, it has to, he cannot fully, 100% accept truth when confronted yes. with it. He's not going to accept it even when he comes. But He'll see it, the reality of it. But whenever he knee bows, it's well, yeah. kind, of a, kind of an acceptance. Well, that's an acknowledgement. There is, an acknowledgement. There's a time when you have to bow your knee even though whether you want to or not. Yeah. You have to, in other words, they're going to acknowledge something even though they don't accept it. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. If you say, I'll never be in jail, and you're in jail, you may not like it. You're rebelling against it, but you're there. Mm. <laughs> I was just thinking like with Jesus when he did these miracles, there's always this opposition coming up, and they have to deny and, you know, divert, and it has to be like that always. Well, those who don't believe do. Yeah, those who don't believe, yeah. Yes. Uh, of course, one day they will acknowledge it. They will acknowledge him that he's Lord. 
but it won't be for salvation. They will do it in dismay. Well, now, is that an example for us when we are witnessing to a family member, say, and they just refuse to accept Christ, and we just try to give up and move on? Well, I think that the only time that you should give up is if they're not alive. Because who knows yeah. what, when and if God would be pleased to bring them to faith. Okay, but There's a time, though, that you don't... This is um, another phrase we'll find in the Gospels. You don't cast your pearls before swine. Mm -hmm. In other words... There's times when you won't say something because you know it's just going to be um, put in derision and blasphemed. And but there is times when they may be more receptive, though they may not accept, but they're not going to uh, curse that which you speak. So there is times we have to discern when I should speak to the unbeliever and when should I be silent? Mm -hmm. But the instructions to these disciples, it sounds like Jesus is saying, if they reject your words, you move on. Yeah. Now, now Barbara, this is where it becomes very important to have the contextual part of what Matthew is speaking. And I can say that to any part of the Bible. Uh, just because the Bible is saying that to the disciples does not necessarily mean it that it is be given to us. That's why I've spent all this time thus far to give you the background of what has happened. The king is on the earth. He's presenting the kingdom. And they, and, uh, they are part of now God's messengers to present the kingdom that's come, that he wants to present that could come on earth and what we're going to find out is they reject that kingdom. Now, we might be able to take a principle here and there, but what context is, today the kingdom is not being offered. Salvation is being offered, but the kingdom is not being offered because the king's not here. One day in the tribulation period, I'm not planning on being there, <laughs> will be raptured. But that again, the kingdom of God will be at hand again. Because the king is about to come. At this present time, I can tell you without reservation that Jesus Christ coming to earth to set up his kingdom can't happen today. The rapture could happen today. Seven years later after the rapture, he's coming. But there are certain events that have to happen before it happens. So now he is bringing forth here this time when he came to earth and he is presenting the kingdom. We know that it didn't happen, that they crucified him, but it's important to see that he's offering the king. The king had promised in the Old Testament he was going to do this. He yep. came to this earth. Everybody who would have any understanding of the Old Testament should have been unbelievably excited if they had eyes to see and ears ahead. The king's here. He's going to bring in the kingdom. Well, that was what he was want, wanting to do, humanly speaking. But in, in the plan of God, it is to be rejected and will be coming again and be established at his second coming which were hinted in the Old Testament that these things would happen. But this is why it's important to have the context of what is happening here. This is not what's happening today. It was happening in the first century. And we're going to see what happens here. And the importance of contextual aspects and understanding the biblical theology of what is happening. It's the same thing if you're in the Old Testament. You've got to be careful, right? Because the Old Testament under the Mosaic Law is given certain principles that may not apply to me in the, in the church. I can make some applications that are proper, but I can't say it's applying to me. The Gospels are okay. under the Mosaic Law, too. And we have to be careful there. I mean, we talked about that on the Sermon on the Mount, right? How to interpret the, the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount properly being in the New Covenant Scripture. So, 
All this is because the scripture was written over 1,500 years. Okay? And it was coming together as now as a whole, and we have the completed canon of scripture. So we need to know the flow of how God was ruling in periods of time so that we not misunderstand what he said. The typical mis <clears throat> problem we have, and I understand it, is that everybody, when you read something, wants to apply it to them right now. And if you do that, it's going to be wrong. Could we may have some application if it's properly brought forth? Yes. But that takes skill when we're doing these <coughs> kinds of things, so to make sure that we have the correct application to the new covenant age that I live in. All right? That's why I'm talking about Matthew here. Matthew and his theology. That's why I went back to chapter 3 and reminded you the kingdom of God is at hand. There's going to come a, a time when he doesn't say that anymore in Matthew. I wonder why. Because it wasn't at hand anymore. And that event's going to happen in chapter 12. Okay? So watch the flow here. That's just why I'm bringing this out. And chapter 10 is a very uh, interesting chapter because... I do, uh, if you've had my prophets course, you'll, you'll appreciate this, but it, at times, Scripture gives you a certain experience that is being stated as a picture of something that is going to happen in the future. It's called typology. This happened, and it is picturing something that is going to happen in the future by way of analogy. We have to have analogy or we can't understand it. And I often say, if somebody came in and said, boy, I just had my 9-11 experience. We understand that they weren't in 9-11, but they're saying that some way 9-11 is the kind of experience I just experienced, but I'm using 9-11 as an analogy. Are you with me? Well, if that way you understand, oh, that's bad. I don't know what it is. They hadn't told me what it is, but it must be bad because I know what 9-11 was. You see what I'm saying? Now he's doing the same thing here in certain passages, and he's going to do it here. We see that the apostles are in the first century are going out and saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And they're meeting some opposition to that. Okay? Now, um, yeah, Reuben? Um, the reason they were worded like that is because they were basically on a mission uh, to, get, to get the word out in a time frame that Jesus wanted it. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we, we tell somebody something once and then we don't tell them ever again. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You know, like you said, when the opportunity comes up, you discuss it. That's right. But it doesn't mean that once you mention it, you don't mention it. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, they, they were on a mission. Jesus was telling them, go out and do this, and don't waste your time sitting there trying to get to the big pole of the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them once and move on. Yeah. So in this situation, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting Matthew in the first century for which we should be doing that because that's where they live. And what was happening because the king was here. And that he was presenting that the kingdom of God is at hand. Remember, what does it mean at hand? Well, it could be coming any moment. <clears throat> Why? Because the king's there. And he could bring the kingdom like that if he wanted to. So that's what they've been that's what the generations of Jewish people have been looking for down through the centuries in the Old Testament. And now it has happened. How will they respond? And in, in this situation, we're going to see that he, they do not respond well. Okay? They reject. <laughs> Did they picture it happening a different way? Well, why would they reject it even to this day? A a after reading all of those prophecies about Christ, well, well, I mean, to this day, they just, you know, the Talmud, they're completely against the yeah. it. 
I can give you a experiential uh, uh, answer and I can give you a theological answer. And they both go together. The, the experiential in, in, in situation is, is that they, they, were, they were not prepared. They wanted a, a different way. They, they, they pictured it whatever they wanted to, to, to think it should have been or whatever. Some people do accept them, as you well know, but not the majority of the nation and not the leadership of the nation. And then the theological answer is, is that men, no matter who they are, Jews or Gentiles, will always reject divine revelation apart from divine grace to open your heart to the truth because we are what we call theologically totally depraved. We have a nature that is against God. And our hearts are hardened. And unless God opens the heart to the truth of it, I will reject it. That's the theological reason. Mm -hmm. Now, they are responsible for their actions. So we have both sovereignty and responsibility put together. Now, back to chapter 10, because I'm about to enter into something very difficult to understand, okay? In verse 16, we see a, a, a transition from the first century for which it could have happened. I mean, Jesus is here, and this could have happened and ended up in the kingdom of God being on earth, uh, humanly speaking. Of course, God has, from the very foundation of the earth, has determined what's going to happen. But as we see it, we could say, well, this could have happened or that could have happened. Now, yeah, from a human viewpoint, yes. Yes. And so we see here, it says, Behold, I sent you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to courts and scourge you in the synagogue. And you shall even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Now that verse right there helped me personally to realize that Matthew is speaking beyond the first century even to the part as he makes this transition to the tribulation period just before the second coming of Christ. But it's kind of mingled with that because they don't they know they don't know here, humanly speaking, whether the kingdom is coming or not. We have the privilege no end didn't. Now why do I say that? Do you remember what he said in verse five of this text? The twelve uh, these twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, Do not go into the way of the what? Gentiles. Now, what did he say in verse 18? Okay, so what that does is it shows me that Matthew is now doing something that's saying they went out to do this, but now there's coming a period of time, I don't know when that's going to happen. When the kingdom will be accepted, and this, that, and the other. But, it's, but this is what's going to happen before it happens. There's going to be a great um, um, disbelief and persecution against you. And so he begins to talk about it here. Now I want, you, I want to read this, and then I want to turn you to Matthew 24 that speaks to this, that you're going to say, well, this sounds just like what Matthew 10 said. And, and we know that Matthew 24 is just before the second coming of Christ. And you say, well, why would he use this language here uh, that would be kind of confusing? Because the kingdom of God is being presented. Both places, right? One was rejected, the other one when it comes won't be rejected and judgment will come and God will establish it. So this is difficult understanding. Matthew is placing this here, I believe, because the kingdom is at hand. 
And these events are going to happen. If the kingdom would have come, which it didn't in the first century, this would have happened. I'm going to take you to Matthew 24 because Jesus begins to talk about the future. Because he knows now, well, historically, as the flow of the book was, you guys have already rejected, so I can speak that this is going to happen in the future. Here, humanly speaking, it hasn't happened where they rejected the kingdom yet. That's going to happen in chapter 12. So notice the language that he's using here. But when they delivered you up, do not become anxious about how or what you will speak for it shall be given to you in the hour what you are to speak. For it is not you who speak, but it's the spirit of your father who speaks in you. And brother will deliver up brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against the parents, and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all on account of my name, but it is the one who endures to the end who will be delivered be saved but whenever the persecution when they persecute you in the city flee to the next and truly I say to you you shall not finish going through the cities of Israel until the son of man comes now, he gave that to his disciples, which he is doing. In the first century, are they dead? No. Yeah. They're, they're no longer living. And you say to yourself, then why hasn't he come? Are you with me? The reason why he hasn't come is because chapter 12 says, I'm postponing it. But that's that's before cha chapter 10 is before, is before chapter 12. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And so the theology here is, is saying these, this thing could have happened. But, it, but in chapter 12, that which he spoke in chapter 10 is going to be postponed. You say, well, it doesn't say that. Well, no, it doesn't say that. But are you reading the entire book of Matthew so that you can come to that conclusion? I say, yes, I have. And I'm reading the theology of it. So is this a, a difficult thing? How easy to just come to one text and say, well, then Jesus must have already come in his glory. His kingdom must have already come. We must have misunderstood it. Or we've misunderstood the whole book of Matthew, that things were postponed. Now, you got to take what I said by faith right this moment. Hold your place here in chapter 10, because we'll be back to it, and turn to Matthew chapter 24. Now, in Matthew 24, he's now speaking about the age to come. Okay? And um, beginning with Matthew 24, verse 4, he is speaking about what we call the tribulation period, or those of you who have had the prophets, the 70th weeks of years of Daniel. That hell on earth that is spoken about just seven years before his second coming. All right? Um, and notice that verse 4 begins the first seal judgment of the tribulation period of Revelation 6. Now the reason why I know that is I have compared it as well as other people. It's not just me. Uh, and compared the seal judgment to what Jesus speaks here and they correspond together. And if they correspond together then guess what? We're in the tribulation period. So notice what it says especially as we get down into past 9 through 14. Because in chapter 24, 4 through 14, he briefly, generally, Jesus does, makes an overview of this, the entire seven-year tribulation period. 
Then in verse 15, he comes back to the middle of the tribulation period, speaking of the abomination of desolation of Daniel, and moves through the rest of Matthew until the end of his coming to the earth in Matthew 24. That's the chronology of Matthew 24. We'll get to it when we get there. Now, why am I taking you here? Notice what it says that it is likened unto the language of Matthew 10. I'll begin reading uh, in verse uh, 5. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For the nation will rise against nation, kingdoms against kingdoms, and various places there will be families and earthquakes. And all, but all of these things are merely the beginning of the birth pains. Mm. Now notice this. Then they will deliver you to tribulation. And you will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time many will fall away and will be delivered up one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will, lead, will mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end shall be saved. Hmm. Did you hear that one? Where would you find that one again? That's found the same as chapter 10 of Matthew, right? And, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. So coming back to our text, they were giving up, they will deliver you up to some people, people who hate you, this, that, and the other. So it's exactly what Matthew 10 is saying here. So on the screen I have given you, some people say this was fulfilled in AD 70. Uh, I don't think so. Some rejection of the kingdom places these verses valid through the tribulation period in the future. That's what I did. That's what I believe. I also believe it's postponed until the tribulation, but it's pictured in Matthew 16 when we get there on the, tra man, uh, on the uh, Mount of Transfiguration. Evangelism of Israel will not be completed until the second coming of Christ. Well, that's true. But I think number two and number three is a way of looking at Matthew chapter 10. Sorry to be so complicated, but I didn't write it. I'm just trying to explain it. So, in Matthew 10, Jesus is sending out his disciples because the kingdom of God is a hand, and notice verse 5, 7, that's what they're supposed to be preaching. If that kingdom would have come, these things in verses 17, 18, 19, and following would have come all the way until his second coming. Matter of fact, until the Son of Man comes, it says in verse 23. Now, uh, so he's explaining to them what will happen in these things. All right, now I'll stop here a second and uh, see if there's a question. Why do you think God would write it in such a way that a very small percentage of Christians would actually get this? Because, I mean, I can go to a church, give them this, and they're going to say, I've never heard of it. Never. Ever. Never. Ever. Yeah. Well. And they'll be like, I've been in this church 20 years. Well, yeah. I don't know. Just telling you. Uh, I mean, I don't see why it would be so. All right. Yeah. I mean, God's word should be, for the, it's for the masses, right? Well, that's why teachers are supposed to teach. Yeah. <laughs> And now, you, you at least, whether you agree with me or not, you no, 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 be, I, I'm no. not saying you have to, but I'm just saying, you, you've got to do something with this text. Right. Everybody's got to do something with this text. <laughs> but, you, but you see a lot of churches, I guarantee you, I'd, I mean, I don't know what the statistics are, but I would say easily 90% of them are not 99. teaching this. Most people will read Matthew and just cherry pick some kind of principle out and teach it. Okay. Uh, if you notice, I'm taking you to the first century. I'm trying to put right. you in the context for which what the author is supposed to, to be putting you. 
and that the kingdom is at hand and this, that, and the other. And so therefore, I need to understand all of that if I'm going to understand what Matthew's point is. Right, because it ties in the future, it ties in the tribulation, it ties in all that, right? But I could easily see a pastor getting up on the pulpit and saying, okay, we get to chapter 12. Okay, he's just reiterating what happened in chapter 10 because it's important <laughs> and then keep moving on, you know? Yeah, he could. But once you understand this and you see the principles that I hopefully are teaching you, you're going to say something different. Right. Okay, and that's why, again, this is why we at the school are trying to teach exposition. We want to know the authorial intent of what the author meant by what he, what he said to the first century audience. And from there, I'll make my applications to the 21st century. Well, it's something like you always said before. If you can think like a Jew, it's much easier to understand the Bible. Yeah. This is true. I, I want to get in this book. I want to follow him. Right, I've better. been following right. along here. He's a Jew. The kingdom of God is at hand. Okay. <laughs> I know the kingdom of God is not at hand at this moment. But I know back then it was. And so what is he speaking to them about? And why did he say it the way he did? Because if they would have accepted it, then this is what would have happened. And they, uh, and they don't accept it. So what does happen? Well, I need to go on tell you. Okay? Amen. All right? So at the side, verse 24 of Matthew 10 says, The disciple is not above his teacher, not about slave above his master, it is enough for the disciples that he becomes a teacher and his slave, his master, if they have called the head of the house, Beelzebub, how much more the members of the household? So what are they going to call you? Of the devil. Okay? Therefore, do not fear uh, them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. But I tell you, in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear, whisper in the ear, proclaim it to the housetops. Okay. Yes? So can I point out something real quick? Sure. Um, when I first started going to the school, I was, in my mind, I was, I was it blew up, didn't flooded. It? Yep. with information. I'm like, how do these teachers know all this and expect us to you know, keep all this information in our head? But as time went by, you know, it stuck. It just did. But that's from reading so much. You know, I like these verses you were pointing out in, in here in Matthew about the, the tribulation time. I, I've, I've read the Revelation about four different times. But I'm doing it in my Bible study right now. So I know this is talking about tribulation time. And I'm not bragging about what I know. I just know from reading it so much that I know I can I can pick and choose those pieces that are future and present and past and you know, stuff like that. It, 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 and that's how I learned it. it. And that's where I got my question. How do y'all know these things? That they go over it and go over it in years and years and years of reading this Bible, this book, and without... And with, you know, ordinary people that sit in the pews, they're not going to know this stuff because they don't study it in depth like we do. So we have to read this book in depth. We can't just read it and move on. Mm -hmm. it's, it's impossible. <laughs> Thank you, Reuben. I'll just say amen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, well, Maybe. He then calls them to discipleship at a high level. You will notice, um, shall I say, verse 32, Everyone therefore who shall confess me before men, I will confess them before my Father in heaven. Whoever shall deny me before men, I shall deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, that's not an absolute truth. He brings peace in your life, right? But in this context, do you see how important context is? Mm -hmm. In this context, it's mm -hmm. not peace. Mm -hmm. So how easy to draw out a passage of Scripture and make it false because you took it out of its context. All right? 
But in the context that we've been talking about, we can see that that is true. For I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemy will be the member of his household, and he who loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's high cost of discipleship, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So in this context of presenting the kingdom and the rejection that possibly could come in, he's saying, listen, this is high stakes. Are you my disciple or are you not? Are you going to follow me or are you not? Are you willing to die for me or are you not? Wow. But really, that's what discipleship is all about, right? I've never been tested, but I want to say that I want to I'd give my life for Christ. I've never been tested to that extent. God would only have to give me grace to do it, but I want to do it. That's what he's calling to. He's calling us to a crucified life. If you saw somebody in the first century carrying a cross, what would you say? You don't know where he's going? Well, maybe you do. But he's a dead man walking, right? Mm -hmm. well, that's the way we are. That's, we have already given up our life. That's what we, Jesus want, wants us to say. We've already, we've already decided. Um, I am going to give my life for Christ. Now that should, be, that, that should not be new to you. But it can become new as you deepen your understanding. And become more convinced. Convicted, and because of the more knowledge you have will help you to stand when you need to stand. All right. Um, we see the opposition of the king come into play in chapter 11. Um, and it came about that when Jesus had finished giving instruction to his 12 disciples, which was chapter 10, right? He departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. So, he's already spoken to the disciples. That's why he gave the disciples a, a challenge, right? And a mandate of what they are supposed to be doing. Now, when John... It, uh, now when John in prison heard of the works of Christ he sent word by his disciples and he said to him are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else now if you know the life of John the Baptist that's a strange statement but it really gives you the understanding of the persecution and the mental wearing that John the Baptist has now in prison for his belief. Yes? I have a question. Um, that kind of struck me. Um, of course, John baptized Jesus and he, he questioned who he was. And I, I thought at that point that he understood who Jesus was. Why is it coming to question again here? I think at least two things in my understanding, Reuben, as I look at it, is, is that John knew because Jesus, I mean, God told him, the, the one you baptize and the one the Spirit comes upon, he's the one. Mm -hmm. That was back when Jesus started. Now this is somewhat uh, far along. And remember his message, that the kingdom of God is at hand. That was, repent! For the kingdom of God is at hand. And now there's been months happen. There's, there's been time lapse. He is now in prison. And the difficulties. And he doesn't see the kingdom coming in. And so it seems, this is all trying to piece things together in John's mind like any person, 
Well, maybe I missed it. Maybe, oh, okay. it, maybe, maybe all that what I said. Well, maybe I didn't quite understand that correctly. He's doubting himself. Yeah, which you can do that, right? Yeah, sure. Because you have certain expectations that you say, well, the king's coming, the king's here, king, well, it's at hand, and it hasn't happened yet. What's going on? I'm in prison. Have I missed it? Did I miss? Did I misspeak? Jesus and the disciples, I mean, he had been to all these miracles for people to believe. But it leads you to think that people were believing John the Baptist before Jesus came. I mean, how, how, how is it the people are believing John the Baptist, but yet here's Jesus doing miracles, and they're not believing him? Well, we, we, are, we have a little bit of an askew. There were some who did, but the majority, I agree, did not. They didn't believe John? They didn't believe John either. He was there oh, again. The Pharisees and stuff come down to get baptized. But, I mean, who was, all of a sudden there's this guy baptized in the water. Yes, sir. Yeah, and that's got to be completely new to them. Yeah, I mean, baptism was uh, in the culture of, of Israel for repentance, no question. And that's what John was using it. You know, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, so to demonstrate your repentance, be baptized. Well, it doesn't say they were going to do it in the Old Testament, but that was just something that was clearly baptism means by the word itself to be identified with. So when you're baptized, you're being identified for the movement for which you've been baptized. As if you are a believer into the church, when you're baptized after you believe, you're saying I identify myself with Christ and this church. For John the Baptist was I identify with John's message that the kingdom is at hand and the king's coming. And I'm getting right because he's here. Why would anybody believe? You know, I mean, I imagine God gives somebody a message today. Anybody. There's so much craziness out there. People say anything. That if somebody really came saying something that really was from God, we probably would just think they're crazy. But this is why, again, the theologically, I know, like I prayed this afternoon, is, Lord, I know that I can't do, I am helpless to communicate what I'm communicating today unless the Spirit of God takes this, what I'm speaking about, and witnesses to your heart. Because if it's not, I'm doing this in vain. Because I can't do it. That keeps me, as an individual who has studied in such a long time, very humble, because even though you might know, how did you get to know? What do you have that haven't been given to you? In other words, he allowed me to see this. Now I'm speaking it to you. He has to, he has to witness that to your spirit that what the word is saying is true and what I'm saying. All this depends upon the spirit of God. And it just happens that God wants to use <laughs> failing individuals like me to do his message. Well, he, didn't, he didn't really need me to do it, but he's, that's his method. He, he takes an old clay pot, as Paul calls it in 2 Corinthians, we're, we're called clay pots, and he puts this beautiful message to be able to be able to be spoken. So don't glorify the clay pot. Glorify the word and the word one who, to whom we point to. So that's why. You're right. I mean, why would anybody want to listen to this? Well, the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and brings it with convictions to the heart of certain individuals. So therefore, every time you get up to speak, I, I became so aware of that as a, as a preacher for 20 years. I remember so many times, I said, Lord, nothing will be, I have studied hard and I have prepared well, Lord, but nothing will be done. No spiritual significance will happen in the congregation today unless you come and take his word and apply it to the hearts of people. Wasn't John the Baptist, wasn't he supposed to be one of the priests and following in line of his father? I don't think he was a priest. Uh, I don't think. Gosh, I don't, I'm thinking now, well, what, 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 what tribe was he from? <laughs> <laughs> but he was chosen well he was from I would assume from Judith being a cousin of Jesus but I'm just guessing um, 
Because his father was a priest. And oh, that's right. He was then, from Levi. So he was supposed to be a priest. So is well, that saying that the priesthood was corrupted at that time? Well, well, he had another calling. He was to be, as Jesus will see and will be able to look at it, if you would have accepted him, he would have been Elijah, which had to come before the coming. That's why in, in, in Matthew we're going to, we'll see it. You see, why do they say that Elijah must come first? Well, because Malachi says so. Well, they would have been easy for them to say, well, see, we can't accept this guy because Elijah's supposed to come first, so he hadn't come. And he, what did Jesus say? If you would have accepted John the Baptist, he's Elijah to come. So is, is Elijah going to come again? Yeah. Uh, I looked that up. It says half the translations say, if you care to know, uh, John was Elijah, who was said would come, and the other half says, uh, "Who is to come again?" Yeah, yeah, so because he, like, because yeah. John was the picture of Elijah. And if it had been that you would accept it, it had been enough to fulfill what needed to be. But it's it's not going to be because because I believe Elijah's literally coming before the second coming of Christ. So you know, you believe that? Like, oh yeah, Elijah's coming. Yeah. Possibly one of the two witnesses in Revelation 11, which we'll get to. Okay. And, and then in Revelation, is it, is it true they're going to, the, the people that are there in that moment, they're going to reject the, the witnesses? I mean, we're going to be gone. To, well, yeah, they're going to kill them. Yeah. According to Revelation. Yeah. And guess what? Three days, three and a half days later, something like that, they die. Yeah, there it is. Well, was it going to be like, like how the Jews saw Jesus? And they just thought it was, it was craziness. Yeah. I mean, is, it, is that how, what, what if we are the ones who see the witnesses like that? You know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, apart, again, this is where Justin, the, the believing heart has his eyes open to the truth. Where those who don't, they always will make excuse and reject the revelation that God gives. Yeah, no, I know. You know, I guess just to help me better do it, because uh, I want to do part learn this too to help other people because people ask questions too. She bet. So, you know, well, I think I know something that's easier to ask somebody who's been doing it for a time here. You know, and see, see what um, would be a more sure. correct answer. Yeah. yeah. I would give them the answer from the scriptures as clear as you can and pray that God would open their hearts. That's what I do. That's what I, you know. <coughs> Ruben? Who do you believe that other way to <laughs> First of all, uh, Scripture doesn't tell us, so we need to be careful here. You can, so I guess. Did you hear that? Guess, guess. Well, I thought, man. Yeah. You believe? But Elijah and Moses, uh, Moses. But that's a guess. That's, that has no so scriptural authority behind. You it. believe it's going back to the transfiguration that when Je when Jesus was on the transfiguration, he met with Elijah and Moses. Yeah. And it, 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 Yes, that's, uh, it's not a statement of that, but they are associated with the kingdom. Right. And uh, when we get to the Mount of Transfiguration, that is actually, uh, they saw the kingdom. Awesome. In many cosmic form, they saw the kingdom. That's why Peter will say in his epistles, <coughs> I have more sure word of prophecy. Mm -hmm. I was there. I saw the kingdom. It, out it wasn't that it came in its fullness, but where he was and how what he saw was part of the kingdom that was to come. And John saw it too. So, so, yeah. so you think it's going to be like they just appear, or you think it's going to be they're just going to be born and like grow up and everybody's going to know who they are, like how they did uh, John the Baptist. He used the spirit of Elijah, but he was born as a baby. He didn't, he didn't just pop out. No, I just think the. I don't know how it's going to happen. I think they're just going to, just like in the Mount of Transfiguration, they're just going to show up. So yeah. it's just two guys walking around in camel hair and stuff? Well, not necessarily they camel hair, but it could. But they, everybody, but the, it's not their dress or, or who they are per se. It is for us. Not for their dress, but who they are. But what they say and the power that they have. Because yeah. if there's implications from the book of Revelation, that God uses them to bring forth the plagues upon the earth. Yeah. So what they speak all of a sudden happens. People go, whoa, whoa, whoa. When they speak, things happen. 
<laughs> so well, they're not going to be ordinary individuals. They're going to stand out. Exactly. Yeah, but they are going to be individuals because they're going to die. What do you, you know, the theory of that? We'll, we'll, we'll get there, bro. We'll get there. <laughs> we'll just don't get off on that right now. We'll, we'll remember, we'll, we'll, it, probably in Revelation we'll get there, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean in 24 and 25. Okay. So back in chapter 11, okay? Um, uh, we we are, are traveling through to understand the witness here. Opposition to John and rejection of the cities. Um, the clarification of John the Baptist is where we want to, to look at in 1 through 19. Um, oh, there's so much here. I wish I could spend time here. But let me just go right straight to, to John the Baptist since we were there already. <laughs> uh, um, Verse 14, and if you care to accept it, he himself is Elijah who is to come. So <clears throat> you have to put together first Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. <clears throat> then we come to Matthew 11, 14, Luke 1, 17, and then back to Matthew uh, 11, 17 to see different verses that, uh, that he gives that talks about John the Baptist. So let's kind of go through them. I'm not going to read the Old Testament. You should, should already know that one. But Matthew 11, 14, we just read. Look at Luke 1, 17. What are we doing? We're trying to put together all that the New Testament says about John the Baptist being Elijah. Luke 1, 17, and it is he who, go, who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So, who is this person? for which Zacharias is the father of. His name is John. And who will he be? He takes him back and says, he's the one for which Malachi speaks about. He's coming in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Okay. Um, Matthew 17. Eleven and twelve. Coming, they're still on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he answered and said, verse ten. And the disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming, and will restore all things. Notice they put that in the future. But I say to you that Elijah already came and they did not recognize him but did to him whatever they wished so also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was spoke, had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Okay? In other words, if if the kingdom would have been brought in, which was rejected, uh, uh, John the Baptist was enough because he came in the spirit and power of Elijah to fulfill what was to need it. But because God knew all that was going to happen, uh, Elijah is still coming, which it says here, and he will restore all things because it's going to be in the future. In the very last verse on chapter 16, uh -huh. he said, I tell you the truth, some of you standing here, he's talking to his disciples, will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So in chapter 17, those three disciples, is that what he's talking about? Mm -hmm. They saw the kingdom. Mm -hmm. He didn't say the kingdom was coming. 
He said that he was, they would see it, and they did in the transfiguration. And Peter testifies that in his epistle, that he saw it. So therefore, what was said is true. Again, demonstrating that the king was here, and he could bring in the kingdom. So are they talking about the transfiguration or the resurrection? A transfiguration. Because that's when the kingdom, Moses was seeing, Elijah did. Uh, if you were Jewish, you would have no, no uh, uh, you know, you'd have the confirmation because what did Peter say? He says, let's build booths. Well, when will they build booths? Well, if Zacharias says, when the second coming comes and Jesus is here, they will celebrate the feast of booths. So, you know, Peter wasn't just speaking out of turn. He was saying exactly what the Old Testament prophets said. Well, John, John fell on his face when he saw the kingdom, but they, Peter started talking about building the tabernacle. Well, yeah, because the tabernacle or booths, because the yeah. Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles, mm -hmm. which is an Old Testament feast, or is said, according to Zechariah, will be celebrated in the kingdom. In other words, by his statements, he was indicating, I believe in the kingdom, because let's do the celebration of booths now. Because we must be in the kingdom. It was only, he, because he, what he was experiencing, thought, well, maybe it's all over the whole globe now. It was just mini cosmic view on that mountain, <laughs> and then it went. It didn't come, it was shown to them. So that's why Peter will say that he has a more sure word of prophecy. Because he saw it. It wasn't that it was just prophesied to him to write it down. He saw it. I saw the cosmic view of the kingdom. All right? That also helps you to say, well, when the kingdom of God is at hand, why? Because the king's here. He said, well, so what? Mount of Transfiguration, he can bring it in. Mm. Well, he wants to. He's such a king. And he did for a mini cosmic view <laughs> on the Mount of Transfiguration. So, all of this becomes an interesting <coughs> understanding if we know the Old Testament. And they're fighting these things. Well, how can this come? If this is going to be fulfilled and this, that, and the other, because they believe those prophecies. Now, in verse 20, uh, I want to do this and we'll take a break. Um, I want to show you God's absolute sovereignty with man's responsibility, which is always a clash or what is called tension in theology, okay? Then he began to re reproach the city, re uh, reproach the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Now, what does that mean? That means God knows not only what's going to happen, but what could have happened, what verse you but mean? did not happen. What verse you mean? I'm in, Ma uh, in Matthew 11, 20 and 21. Yeah. And 22. So he knew not only the possibilities, but all probabilities. Even if it didn't happen. And you, Capernaum, verse 23, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You shall descend to the Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, Capernaum, it would have remained to this day. He also knew that. But it didn't happen. He knows all the possibilities and probabilities, but he has also ordained what he wants that sometimes is strange to us. Nevertheless, verse 24, I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of the judgment than for you. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I praise thee, O Father, 
Lord of heaven and earth, that you hid these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to babes. Yes, Father, for thus it is well pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. To reveal Him. That's sovereignty, isn't it? He determines who He reveals to. But notice the next verse is man's responsibility. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. If you see the conflict, you say, well, how can I come unless you reveal it? Unless he reveals it to me. So again, the tension of theology is God knows exactly whom he's going to draw and who he's going to come, but everybody has the responsibility of coming. So how can you fit that? Well, you'll have problems. But that's the theology that's left in it. So I have absolute sovereignty and man's responsibility in tension in verses. I will leave that tension where the scripture leaves the tension. On that. Come unto me all who are weary and heavy, uh, uh, heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And I am gentle and humble at heart and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Man, all that is great. Those first, yeah, those first is there. Yeah, and you will have constant tension. Verses 27 to that is great. Yes, sir. God draws his own to himself, but everybody's responsible to come. <laughs> let's take a break about 20 minutes come back and Lord willing we'll start again and you don't want to miss chapter 12 okay we're going to get uh, into chapter 12 and chapter 12 is very heavy it's heavy? yes sir you didn't think it was been heavy thus far? <laughs> if you didn't think it was heavy thus far it is now how's that? No, but it's, think, not, it's okay. I think it's been here all along. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we come to the crescendo of the opposition to the king. And what I've been in show, helping you, hopefully, to see um, of this opposition. And uh, I want to begin with verse 22 uh, to show you this opposition. Uh, that he is speaking about. It's in the context, it says, verse 22, Then there was brought to him a demon-possessed man who was blind and dumb, and he healed him so that the dumb man spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and began to say, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? And what do they want you to say? Do they answer that question? What's the implication by the way it was translated that they want you to say? They want to say that if he's the son of David, he's the Messiah, right? Yeah. This man cannot be the son of David, can he? The answer they want you to say is, well, no. No. There's a way of doing that in Greek. There's two different... Uh, articles that negates something and in a question uh, it can help you to see whether how the author wants you to answer the question and the answer here well translated is not yeah that's true surely can't be well it is but they want you to say no that gives you the indi an indication that what is about to happen they have been rejecting and rejecting and rejecting God 
Jesus Christ through his presenting himself as the king and the kingdom is at hand. That this is the point where he says, it's kind of like keep piling on, keep piling on, and finally the, the donkey can't, can't go anymore, right? It crushes under the weight of the um, uh, opposition. <clears throat> Notice verse 24. And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This man cast out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Remember, they can't. Have, have we seen this before? Yes. Yes, that's why I pointed it out in chapter 9. So this is not just the first time they've said it. It is something that the leadership is continuing to say. And now being confronted with it, they again said, that which God has done, it's been done by demons. Yes. So Professor, you know how we always talk about that uh, Jesus set aside the divine, the use of his divine attributes? Uh -huh. So on number 25, the verse, it says, and knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, is it knowing their thoughts like actually reading their minds? Or is it because of what they said, he's, it's an observational thing where he knows their thoughts because of what they said? Who knows okay. for sure, uh, but... Um, uh, he but if could, he, he could be told by the Father or by the Spirit. Okay, the yeah, Spirit. That's that, okay. That's, that he that, knows these things. Gotcha. That, so it that, comes whichever. That, I was going to say the Spirit, but that, that makes more sense. Okay, great. Okay. And uh, knowing that their, their thoughts, he said to them, any kingdom divided against itself lays waste, and the city of, or house divided against itself shall not stand. He's going to give a logical conclusion to a statement like that, and he's giving a divine uh, a statement. Yes. Professor, the Pharisees, I mean, did, 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 they, did they know and understand that he was doing this by the power of God, but they, they still didn't want him there, so they made this up that he was doing it by the power of Beelzebub? That is exactly the issue yeah, that they, comes they're, to they're, play. They're going against God. What uh, Jesus is implying in what he'll be saying soon, you might miss me, as the Son of God because I'm in my humiliated state as the God-man voluntarily set aside the rightful use of my attributes and I look like a man only. But you can't miss what the Spirit of God has done. And so now you're attributing what the Spirit of God is doing to Beelzebub. Okay? But it's in connection with Jesus being the king and presenting the kingdom. Are you with me? So you got a lot of balls up in the air right now. You've got Jesus presenting that the kingdom of God is at hand. And we have him doing miracles to demonstrate that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he's doing it through the power of the Spirit of God. And you might miss me because I'm in my humiliated state as a man, God-man, but you can't miss what the Spirit of God's doing. You guys are in real trouble. And he's about to tell them that. Okay. So he first said, how could I be doing, how, if Satan's doing this to me, then why am I casting out Satan? How can he, that would be dividing his own house. That makes sense. You with me? So he answers first way, just, is a logical statement. You guys are not logical. I mean, how could you? How, if I was of Satan, counting out Satan, then was that? I mean, he's dividing his kingdom. He's working against himself. That doesn't make sense. In other words, what you're saying is incorrect. They weren't engineers. They weren't engineers. Now, and um, then he begins um, verse. Let's see. Cast out Satan, verse 26. He is divided against himself, and how then shall his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? <laughs> so it's implications of what they are doing. Consequently, they will be 
be your judge or judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, which is the case, right? Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Remember that what the issue is here. You guys are missing the king and the kingdom that's coming. And now you are rejecting formally by, uh, by saying that what I'm doing is of Satan. Mm. Or how can anyone enter into the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven man, men, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Now, what most people do is they, they take this rip this completely out of its context mm. and look at this one verse and not the surrounding circumstances of why that one verse was stated. Well, what is the context? The context is Jesus is on earth. He is presenting himself as the king and that the kingdom of God is at hand. And you should have known that because I'm using the power of the Spirit of God to do magnificent works to testify that the kingdom of his God is at hand. Mm. And now you are saying that what was done by the power of the Spirit of God to demonstrate that the kingdom is at hand is of the devil. And because you have done that, you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, which cannot be forgiven. And so you, as a generation of Jewish leaders, are through. You are you are gone. Your sins cannot be forgiven. Okay? Now, remember, can this can this sin be be uh, um, uh, acted or, or done today? No. No, why? Jesus is not on earth. He's not presenting the kingdom. The Spirit of God is not bringing forth miracles to indicate that the kingdom is at hand. Are you with me? Now, you can blaspheme the, the, the Holy Spirit by, by going against the Holy Spirit, and it can be forgiven. But this blaspheme, that's why I, I, when I say the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit, I put it in T-H-E right. and all in capital. It's a the, this one, this kind of one, cannot be uh, uh done today because it was historically connected to what the kingdom was. Okay? In the tribulation period, you can do it again. Okay? But you can't do it today. You can blaspheme the Spirit. It can be forgiven because it's not doing this specific blasphemy. Are you with me? Yeah. yeah. It's, see, see, do you see now how important it is to keep the context of right here? Now, I'm going to prove this further by what Jesus says, but what I'm trying to make sure I bring forth here is that you can't do, you can't commit this sin today. This kind of blasphemy against the Spirit. Alright? It's conditioned upon the King being here presenting the power of the Kingdom through the power of the Spirit of God and, and, the, and therefore you say that it is of the devil. Well, that's impossible to do, to do this today. Yes? What about the Ananias and Sapphira? Ananias and Sapphira? Uh, and Sapphira. Mm -hmm. uh, Sapphira. Mm -hmm. uh, they committed a sin against the Holy Spirit and they died, mm -hmm. but they went to heaven. They went to heaven? Oh, yeah. They're saved. They're That's believers. why the church was shocked. Because they're yeah. believers. It's, it, it was a temporal judgment yeah. against them. Can God, can God take believers home because they continue in unconfessed yeah. sin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Read 
You can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 about uh, Paul saying that he commits him over to Satan, that his body may be destroyed, but his soul may be saved. So the, God may take you home because you soiled his name, but if you have truly believed his name, you can't lose it. He may take you home. <laughs> we often call it take you home early. I think, I think he's doing you a favor because you're to preserve your rewards. Oh yeah, but he's also to keep from soiling yeah, his name on sure. earth. Yeah. Yeah. He's doing you a favor. Is it a dangerous <laughs> thing for a Christian to continue in unrepentant sin? Yes. Oh, but you ain't a kid. You say, well, I can't leave for salvation. Oh no, but he can take you. He can take you out just like that. Just like he did Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. Back to back. Daniel's here. We ought to be fearful. I, I'm feeling good. So, here we have uh, this particular thing happened here, which is so misunderstood. And But I hope everybody's got at least my understanding and I believe uh, uh, of the scriptures here. Everybody all right? Mm -hmm. Now, let me uh, add to that by looking at the continued message that Jesus gives about this specific time. At this point in Matthew, and when Jesus is on earth, this generation of leadership and unbelieving people are through. They're gone. They cannot be saved. You're going to see how bad they are because in Matthew 23, Jesus speaks to them. Just go and read what how you. I've had so many people. Well, he's kind of harsh here in Matthew 23 of what he's talking about the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all of that. I say, yeah, they're through. This generation is gone. Uh, you know, will God save individuals within them? Yes, but as a whole, this generation is gone. They're through. They have rejected. God and his kingdom. Now, notice something else. Nowhere else, not, after Matthew 12, nowhere do you find that the kingdom of God is at hand anymore. He doesn't say that anymore. Why? Because it is. It's been what we would call, from a human perspective, it's been postponed because it was rejected. It will come again in the future. From God's viewpoint, it's always in his plan. From the human viewpoint, we say, well, it's now been postponed. So is it your view that it's just that generation? Because I think some other commentators, and didn't Logan mention this, that they believe the, uh, it's the generation all the way. It continues up until the tribulation because corporate Israel still doesn't believe. Yes. Um, there is a sense that uh, there is a hardening that comes right. upon Israel. Okay. Uh, but he uses the hardening part let me show you a reason why I said, if you think generations go beyond that, okay. but notice what he, how he argues in beginning with verse 38 and following. Okay. And some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he said, answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation, not generations, Gotcha. Crave for a sign, and yet no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall stand up with this generation at the judgment and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold something greater than Jonah is here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then verse 42 he gives it a second uh, implication just in case you missed it. The queen of the south shall rise up with this generation at the judgment and shall condemn it because she came from the end of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Now, just in case 
they didn't hear it, he does a third thing mm. to this generation. Wow. Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through the waterly, waterless places, seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, he finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. I hope you realize that he's using a house as an individual. Mm -hmm. You with me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Verse 44, then I say, I will return to my house for which I came, and, which, uh, and when it, uh, it comes, it finds unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it, it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. Now, why did he tell the story? The next statement. This is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Man, it's off the table. Yeah, it's off the table. Oh, it, it's through. You're gone. This generation, you are, you're through. Okay. And that's what happened at the blasphemy of the Spirit. This generation. And again... Remember, it's all up to this point. Kingdom of God is at hand. Kingdom of God has sent out his side. Kingdom of God is at hand. Is at hand. And all of a sudden, this happens. Generation gone. No more stated the kingdom. He doesn't preach the kingdom anymore. Matter of fact, he does something uh, in chapter 13 that demonstrates again of this crucial point. So let's begin here in chapter 13. Then. Um, he gives a parable uh, of the sower, which is often used uh, in each of the uh, most in the, in the synoptics. And as he sowed, some of the seeds fell on the road. And the birds came and ate them up, and others that fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they, were, uh, they, they withered away. And others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And the others fell on good soil, and yielded a crop of some hundredfold, sixty and thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, notice what he just did. He began to speak to them in parables. Now, why did he do that? He's going to explain. And the disciples came and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. This is something, when, when the scripture uses the word mystery, it means that it wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. This is something that is now new. But that's why it's a mystery. You can't find it in the Old Testament. And he's now going to talk about the mysteries about this kingdom that has just been rejected. <coughs> All right? But to them it has been granted. To you guys. For whoever has, to him shall more be given. And he shall have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. They just simply reject it. Well, he, he is now going to blind them in it. Mm. Notice. And in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 6, being fulfilled, which he says, you keep on hearing, but you will not understand. 
you will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of the people will become dull, and will their, uh, 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 and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return, and I should heal them. That's a prophecy from Isaiah 6, that God would uh, blind and cause death to come upon his people because of the rejection of him. Now he's quoting that passage from Isaiah 6. But blessed are your eyes, disciples, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Then hear then the parable of the sower. So what we find then, the consequences of Israel's rejection was to introduce an inter-advent age of God's kingdom program which was revealed as well as concealed by the use of parables. So the purpose of them, to teach some specific spiritual truth, to reveal new truth to receptive hearts, and to conceal new truth to rejected hearts. So now he speaks in parables. So those who can, can hear and see will understand it, and those who don't, well, something has completely changed, huh? And it's because they had rejected God, specifically his son as the king, and now the kingdom is no longer at hand because it was rejected. Will the kingdom come? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it will come when he comes again. Yeah. Now, how many times have you heard that about parables? Never. <laughs> it's not taught. But now do you see how it fits the theology, the biblical theology of Matthew and what he's presenting in his flow of his book? Okay. Let me ask you this here. You're, you're, you're a pastor. Yes, sir. You've been... Dr. Sullivan, right? Yes, sir. He, and he, he, he don't have a, doc, a doctor's degree. You don't need one. I, I, when I was a pastor, let me make, go ahead. I know you don't. But you sit in the pew, maybe behind the pulpit. Do you have to watch what you would think if he make a mistake from the pulpit? In his, in his theology and his doctrine or something? I told my people when I was a pastor mm -hmm. that when I preached to them, they need to go home and check it out to see what, it, what I said was correctly according to the Word. Because if you trust me and you check me out, you will check everybody out. We just need to check it. Is your pastor... As knowledgeable as you, if you will. Yeah, I think he is. He's he's a very good student of the word. Okay. Very good student of the word. I mean, I haven't sat down and gone through each passage, but he's he does the ex he does what we're doing here. He's, doing he's the thorough. exposition of the scriptures. That's what we do at the, at the school, at our church. You know, I I teach there. Others teach that. I mean, but that's the um, history of our church for 50 years is that it has done the exposition of the scriptures. When we teach, we try to exposit the scriptures and what it says. It should be that way. Yeah, everybody. But that's what we teach here. Uh, the reason why I ask is because I find your teaching fascinating. I'm sure I'm not the only one in class who thinks so. They're just not saying it. Oh, he already knows. I guess I'm bold enough to say it. 
Well, it's, it's, it. it's, not, it's not the teacher, it's not the instrument, it's the word for which is there. I mean, I'm just, right. I'm I'm just explaining right. what the word right. is saying. Right. I so understand it. So that we should marvel at the word. Yeah. yeah. Well, the problem is that most people don't do this. But this is why, this is the way we teach here, so that you, by God's grace, will do it somewhere else. Be glad when I know what you know and more. Well, good. I hope you do. Step on my shoulders and go. Oh, Move on no. up. That's what I've done with others. <laughs> I've stepped on their shoulders. <laughs> I had my mentors and doctors. You go to that church, brother? I go to the Bible study. So does he. Oh, okay. All right. We're on break. Uh, limitation of parables then. Parables are forms of Jewish wisdom literature and therefore contain usually only one or two major points of analogy. Point, do not make everything in a parable represent something and miss the one point for which it's intended. <laughs> People use parables it wrongly and especially the ones here in, uh, in chapter 13. Because they are telling us what's going to happen in between the comings of Christ. Okay? It's now going to give you the mystery about what's happening in between the comings because the kingdom now has been postponed, humanly speaking. Okay? It's always been in the plan of God, but we now are making sure it does. And now he's going to give us these parables. All right? So, um, notice the parables of Matthew 13. You have four by the sea and four in the house. That's not as important as what they represent. So, the first one, we just, uh, we just got through reading, right? Or did we? Dealing with the um, uh, yielding crops, 100 fold, 60 fold. Yeah, we talked about that. So, what's, I, I'm breaking this down. Dr. Bailey, uh, who's president of Dallas Seminary, did his doctoral dissertation on the, this, these parables. Hmm. And so, I've gleaned a lot from his studies. Uh, the, so, I deal it with the problem, the central truth, and then uh, what are we looking at? Okay? Dissertation. So, um, why isn't Israel more receptive to the Messiah? Uh, the soils will teach us productivity is determined by receptivity of the heart. Okay? Mm -hmm. And we see that in the parable of the soils. Some on rocky soil, some that come up and uh, didn't have any root, and then they in the choked by the weeds and then the one that brings forth um, uh, productivity. The second planting parable in chapter 13 uh, is 24 through 30 and then it talks about 34 through 43. Mm -hmm. Some things there. The problem what accounts for the false religiosity of the world? Central truth. Satan has sown the world with counterfeit kingdom which will not be fully revealed until judgment. Notice verse 24 when it reads this way. He presented another parable to them saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seeds in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemies came and sowed tares also among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprang up and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. And the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? We. And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the slave said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? In other words, pull up the, the weeds. 
tear? And he said, No, lest while ye were gathering up the tear, which you would have burned, right? You may root up a wheat with them. God's concerned about his wheat. Mm -hmm. Okay? Allow both to grow together. Now that's the strange thing about what's happening but in between the coming. You got both wheat and tares growing up together. You got good people and bad people. All right? All right? Or believers and non believers. Religious people and true saved people growing up together. Uh, then he says, no, both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them into bundles to burn. Uh, uh, but gather the wheat into my barn. So he says, no, nah, let everything go until the time that I come again and we'll take care of it. Then he has two growth parables. First, the mustard seed, <coughs> 31 and 32, which reads, He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seed, but when it is full grown, it is larger than then the garden plants and became, becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in the branches. Well, the problem is, what will this inter-advent kingdom program uh, grow? In other words, what's going to happen in between? Central truth, it will begin small. In other words, the church what? Begins small but will have an abnormal growth, it is possible that the birds represent the evil be, will be present in it. Though they'll be good in it too. All right. The second growth uh, parable is about the leaven process. We're in one verse there. Both another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like Leaven, which is a woman took and hid in three pecks of meal until it was all leaven. The problem, what will be the character of this new kingdom? The central truth, the kingdom will grow to a point where at the end there will be great apostasy. Mm -hmm. Others believe the central truth is that the kingdom will grow from an internal dynamic not from an external organization. That's Dr. Bailey's. I differ with him on that one. Then he gave two value parables, the hidden treasure and the pearl merchant. 44 uh, says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid and from joy over it he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. The problem? How valuable is this newfound program of God? The central truth? The kingdom of God is so valuable that a man should give up everything necessary to be part of it. The second value, dealing with the pearl merchant in 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all he had and bought it. So, problem, how valuable was the kingdom again? Well, the kingdom was established through the total self-sacrifice of Christ the great pearl 
Finally, the two responsibility parables, the dragnet and the horse, uh, householder. 47 through 50, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea, gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach. And they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels shall come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the central truth is that the worldwide uh, influence which will be used to judge men at the end of the age. Yes. I, I noticed in that one, it said they will take the wicked out from among the righteous. And the other one, it says that the harvest, it says first, you know, it'll bundle up the uh, chaff. Well, so, you know, the rapture says that the good goes out first, but the these are saying that the evil is going to be taken out. Yes. And so you're looking at two different events. One, the rapture before the seven-year tribulation period. And one at the end. And at the end of the tribulation of seven years, Jesus literally comes to the earth, and that's when that happens that he's speaking about. <coughs> that's when the evil will be thrown out, and the others left to go into the kingdom. Very good observation. All right, then 51 and 52, uh, have, have, your under, have you understood all these things? And they said to him, yes, well, they did. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings forth out of his treasure at, at things new and old. Central truth, edification should include old and new truths about the kingdom program of God. Old in the sense of finding from the Old Testament and what it said, now combining with what is new being presented about in the New Testament so, so that we understand the kingdom and what it will be. Okay? So, question. Are you understanding, or are you one of those who do not understand? <laughs> They're interesting parables, right? Yeah. All right. So, knowing what we have just went through, understanding by what he says is the, um, this generation is through. Making his parables in 13 to help us to see something new is going to happen. He now continues because he's headed toward the cross. Okay? In other words, the cross must happen before the kingdom comes. Matter of fact, many years before, right? And uh, we now will see the ugliness of this rejection that was stated in chapter 12. And remember, in Matthew, never again is it mentioned that the kingdom is at hand. It's no longer at hand because they have rejected it. But it is sure it's going to happen, but it will happen when he comes again. All right, um, the rejection of John the Baptist by Herod. This is when, um, what happens to John the Baptist here? Gets his head cut off, right? So John now goes into glory. Not the worst thing that happens to have our head cut off with it. <laughs> worst thing that happens is you trust Jesus and got your head cut off. Right? <laughs> okay. So, John goes into glory uh, in these things. Now, again, um, um, we see Herod and his ilk who are 
rejecting God in these kinds of things. And so therefore, I want you to see here a, a theological movement in Matthew that I will mention at the end again. What, what am I saying? Do we need to read the scriptures and know the immediate context so that we correctly teach it? Yes. Mm -hmm. But do we also need to know how that particular pericope, that particular group of verses, fits in the overall argument of Matthew? Yeah. Yes. I've just showed you that, hopefully, by how they rejected the kingdom and what has happened since then and what's going on. And how the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit fits in historically with that understanding. So, is it important to understand the overall flow of a gospel? <coughs> oh, oh, if you are to understand it correctly. All right. So, um, we have uh, in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 14 uh, a test for his disciples. And he, uh, I'll see verse 14. And when he went uh, ashore, he saw a great multitude, and he felt compassion for them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, The place is desolate, and the time is already past. So send the multitudes away, that they may go into the village and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Can you imagine that? Me? I, we don't have anything. Why would Jesus do such a thing? Only a test. What's that? Only test. test. Yeah, test. He's testing them. But he, he fed them before this, right? And, and he says, you know, basically Jesus did it the first time, the second time he says to the disciples. I, I look at it as, as the church where, you know, he set an example, and, and while people are praying, you know, oh, you know, God help the poor, or whatever, it, it basically, you know, the same thing, feed them, you know, and he's saying, well, you feed them, you know, and, and I'm, I'm also just like, a, not not trying to say I'm, I'm using the allegory, but in a sense, I mean, I see that as to, uh, but I know in the context, he, he was doing this with the disciples, but I think also for, for the future generations, like, in, feed them. yeah. Well, he he wants them to see, wants them to see that they can't do this. They need to depend upon him. Okay, you feel? So, well, all of a sudden they go, well, you know, I can't do this. Precisely, you're going to have to trust me. Look to me. What what was their response? Send them away. Let them get their own stuff. You know, this, that, and the other. And so instead of the, the response to be, they're hungry, Lord, what should, what should you do? How can we help? Or can we? I mean, they're, they're, they're telling Jesus what to do. <laughs> Send them away, God. Are you his counselor? Yeah, you, can't, you can't tell God. How many times do we tell God, Lord, all I need is this in prayer? Oh, I, how do you know? I mean, are you, have you just become God's counselor? Of telling him what we need and what yeah. we need to do. That's arrogance. Yeah. Yeah. So they're doing the same thing here. Jesus is just saying, "Well, then you feed them." <laughs> of course, he's going to he's going to feed them and he's going to teach them many things. And so, uh, in the evening, disciples came and said these things to him. Then verse seventeen, and they said to him, "We have only five loaves and two fish." And he's going to say, "Bring them to me." And ordering the multitudes to recline on the grass, he took the five loaves and two fish, looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food, and breaking the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave it to the multitudes. And they all ate, and were satisfied. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 full baskets. 
I wonder why it was 12. Yeah. Well, why, why not 8? Why not 10? One for each tribe? I don't know. Yes, One it's a tribe. Jewish thought, isn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. These guys need to learn. You say it's a what now? I, I think, as we're going to see here, in uh, Matthew using these uh, para, uh, 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 miracles, a, a, a direction to Israel from is God's now look going from Israel to the Gentiles. Now he hasn't done it here, he's, but he's going Jesus. to by the biblical theology of Matthew. Okay, right We're because we see that because one he fed the, the Jews and the other one he fed the Gentiles, right? Yes, because it's different the, sides of the and river. Twelve basketfuls of Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Leftovers. There was a, a, a there, there, there seems to be there was an abundance. No one, if you have twelve baskets full left over, everybody ate what they wanted. They everybody's full. But second of all, why twelve baskets? Right. Mm -hmm. And that seems to indicate twelve tribes of Israel. Yeah. I'm speaking to Israel now. I may be wrong on that because that's not what the text says. I'm making an implication from the text. But I know he's moving by the use of Matthew's uh, of stories shifting from Israel to, to the emphasis upon the Gentiles. And uh, I guess I can show you now. But this is what he's basically doing. Seven baskets. He's taking the 12 baskets full. The Jewish reaction was little or no faith to the Canaanite reactions of feeding of the 4,000 where there was great faith and the Jewish reaction, uh, and, and there were seven baskets left. So he's turning from Israel to the Gentiles and then in chapter 16, what does he talk about? Church. The church. only little section that he talks about the church. Mm -hmm. So therefore I'm trying to follow the thought of, of, uh, of Matthew and his thinking and how he put, now, and remember Matthew could have put all humanly speaking, could have put all kinds of stories in this, this uh, uh, what we call a gospel. Did he put everything he knew? Of course not. He had to limit what he was putting in. Why did he put it in there? What message is he telling us? And this is an interesting of look of not just one story after another, <coughs> which has its own importance and its own application, but then when you look at what is being done theologically as he puts them together, just like he did previously when he talked about the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. He's now showing, I'm moving from you Jews, who as a whole has been what? Cut off to the Gentiles, for which, if you really want to go back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, in you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth, families of the earth will be blessed. He's now doing exactly what he said in the Old Testament also, moving from a, Gent from a Jewish context to a Gentile context because of the disobedience of the Jewish people. For which, remember, in chapter 13, he quoted Isaiah chapter 6 of the, how they would be hardened. Mm -hmm. So he knew all of this was going to happen. And Matthew now is putting all that theology together by even using Old Testament passages for which it speaks about. So this is not news, even specifically uh, if you will study the Old Testament, exactly what the Old Testament teaches. But now Matthew is putting it together to demonstrate a moving from a Jewish who have now been hardened in part <coughs> to the Gentile aspects, and I'll talk about a church. And isn't it interesting that the church is not mentioned anywhere else until we get to Acts mm -hmm. except in Matthew 16. And 18. But that little section there, and that's the ending of what 
is the shift in how he did the miracles and how he put them together. Um, it, they did happen that way, but also there could have been a lot of stuff in between. He didn't use those because not only is he telling you about these parables and that they actually happened, but he's giving you theological implications of why they are put together. That he's moving from Jewish, which now have been rejected, to a Gentiles, which is exactly what he's going to do in the church. But using my imagination, there's seven baskets. Now that's symbolic to completeness, right? The number seven. Yeah, so it, it often point. is. Mm -hmm. And so in this so case, I don't mind, mind using that because right. of, of what he seems to be doing theologically hmm. or biblical theology of how he's moving from the feeding of the to the Canaanites to the Jewish reaction. Uh, they had great faith. Jewish people, not much faith. And he's moving from that, and then I says, I'm going to build my church. So now once he has completed his part, that part of the mission as to who he wanted to get his, you know, his word to, that's the Jews and the Gentiles. So now he's ready to build on that. Build, start with chapter 16, building yeah. the church. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Now, e even though the church is not in existence, even mm -hmm. though the church, they don't even understand, they don't have any concept of it. Uh, uh, Matthew would now because he's writing later but at the time it was written very little was known because the church is a mystery that's what Paul says in Ephesians right. mystery in a sense that you couldn't find it in the Old Testament it's always been in the plan of God but it's now a mystery because it's new revelation that was not mentioned in the Old Testament which Moving from Jewish to Gentile was hinted in, was presented in the Old Testament. All right. So let's kind of look through these then. With that understanding, I hope I'm giving you a, a positive view of what is called biblical theology. In other words, taking the, the writing as a whole and how is he not there's such a tendency is there not when you read it you just read one story and then you then you don't think about it anymore you read the next little parable or what it's yeah. done and the next thing and, and you don't think about is there any thought to how it's put together and is it making any message in all of those stories yeah you can learn a, a important things in each of those what they call pericopes those stories those groups of verses but what is he saying also about the whole series mm -hmm. of those verses together? Mm -hmm. And yeah. there, is a, there is a message also in that, which is, is a typical example. The same way what I taught you from chapter 3 through chapter 12 in the presenting of the kingdom and how it was what? Then rejected. That's what was going on. You could teach every one of those aspects between 3 and 12 and, and teach something about each of those stories, which would be okay if you do it properly. But also we should, I think, also teach what the overall purpose is of why uh, Matthew wrote those things so that you have an a overarching understanding of the particulars. All right. I hope I'm opening your understanding to... Uh, how you can study the Gospels and how the Gospels should be studied. Matter of fact, you can do the same thing uh, with New Testament epistles. It's just a little more difficult because you have to, if you want to do Pauline theology, you have to look at all of Pauline's letters and what did he say about a subject in all of his letters. That's a study, right? <laughs> yeah. You're going to take Paul and his understanding. What has he thought about the church? Well, you'd have to then read all of his letters to see what he said about it. It's biblical theology. It's taking what the scriptures teach about a certain group or period of time where systematic theology is trying to make what does that subject being taught throughout the entire Bible. Okay? Both are important. 
so that we don't teach one thing over here that contradicts over here because we didn't study the whole subject systematically and we have misunderstood something. Okay. Yes. Professor, um, this might seem like a silly little question, but uh, in my Bible, that, that verse 13 through uh, 21 is, is titled uh, 5,000 fed. Uh, when I go to verse 21, it says there were about 5,000 men who ate besides women and children. Why, did, um, why weren't they included in the number? Just curious. Is it just really no purpose or rhyme or reason? Or uh, I, I was not told, but I have a, uh, what shall I say, uh, I am not uh, inspired by what I said is the children move around. And it'd be hard to, <laughs> it'd be hard to, to, to count them. I don't know how to why he did but he just indicated, yeah, there were 5,000 adults, but then there was many more other children there. Well, but that says besides women, though. Huh? They didn't include the women. Could women either, yeah. 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 One of the easier ways is that uh, oftentimes they, they tell them to sit down and to put in groups, and usually by families. Right, that'd be 5,000 Therefore, households. the male would get up maybe and yeah. to get the food for that group sure. and so they would know easier to to count males because they came and got the food be like five thousand back houses. to their family yeah. be five thousand households so that that's what i would assume though reuben i don't have the word to you indicate yes 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 all right um I got some time here. Let's see. Let's look at the Jewish response of the first one in verse 22. And immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to um, the other side while he sent the multitude away. And after he sent the multitude away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. So he spent some time in prayer. If the Son of God thought it was important to pray, <coughs> I think we should be, huh? Uh, the boat, let's see. In a room locked himself. <laughs> but the boat was uh, already uh, many stadia away from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were frightened, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. At least he knew better than him just walking on it. Right? <laughs> command him to do it. He said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. That's all he could probably get out. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and, and said to him, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place together recognized him, they sent him to all the surrounding districts and brought to him all who were sick. And they began to entreat him that they must that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak, and as many as touched it were cured. So, 15 uh, verses 1 through 20, we see that the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus saying, Why do you disciples transgress the tradition <laughs> of the elders? And uh, why, why do your 
and have yourself transgressed the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition. And God said, honor your father and mother. It begins to uh, really basically rebuke them. And uh, so uh, uh, he interacts with these uh, unbelieving um, leaders that are coming out to, to see him. Um, I want to start here. Let's say uh, verse 15. And Peter answered and said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the thing that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder adulteries, fornication, theft false witness and slander these are things which defile the man but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man and Jesus went away and from there withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon now, what, where is that located? Phoenicia? Yeah, it's up northeast by the Sea of Galilee. So therefore, is he in Jewish country? No. No. Mm -hmm. no. He's out of it now. Okay. And he's now going to make, he has some Canaanites. That's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. You know about the Canaanites, right? They are the ones for which were conquered by Joshua. He said, Bo, a Canaanite woman came to him, verse 22 of chapter 15, saying, Have mercy uh, on me, O Lord, son of David. Now, in the, what, what was that indication of? She knew who he came from. He was Messiah. I mean, here is the Jewish nation not recognizing their Messiah, and here's a Canaanite recognizing him. Whew! Boy, is that a difference. But, he's, but he did not answer her word, and his disciples came to him and kept asking him, saying, Send her away, for she shouts out after us. <laughs> She is persistent, saying, Son of David, help! <laughs> but he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the puppy dogs, to the dogs. And it, some people said, Wasn't that demeaning? And she said, Yes, Lord. She didn't blink an eye. Me too, my little sinner. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs that fall from the master's table. In other words, you don't belong at the table. Yeah, but crumbs fall. I mean, I want one of those crumbs because I know where the table is. In other words, she didn't mind unbelieving herself. She realized that she doesn't deserve this. But may I ask you a question? Does anybody deserve it? No. Answer is no. <laughs> so she, she is now bringing out, I realize I don't deserve it. Israel ought to have said the same thing. I don't deserve it. Even though they were able to sit at the table. And so Jesus answered and said to her, Oh woman, your faith is great. Great. Where he had to tell them in chapter 14, when they didn't, when Peter and them didn't respond, the Jewish people, Oh, you have what? Little faith. Why did you doubt? So you have this feeding of the 5,000 and the Jewish reaction is you have little or no faith. Now you have this 4,000 being done 
and you have great faith from a Canaanite. Whoo! This is interesting. And so, and departing from there, Jesus was went along by the Sea of Galilee, having gone up to the mountain, he was sitting there, and the great multitude came to him, bringing with them those who had lame and crippled and blind and dumb and many others, and they laid them down at his feet and he healed them. So that the multitude marveled as they saw the dumb speak, the crippled restored, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, see, and they glorified the God of Israel. And Jesus called to his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the multitude because they remain with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not wish to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Where is he located? By the sea. Sydney. Huh? He, yeah, he departed from the Sea of Galilee and, and he hadn't gone up to the mountain. He sat on it there and then he, a great multitude came to him. So it, it is somewhere outside of Galilee, right? <laughs> in the Galilean Sea area. Uh, what did he say in verse 21? <coughs> he went up to Tyre and Sidon up mm -hmm. there, right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of uh, interesting, somewhere in between there maybe. Uh, and Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the multitude because they remain with me these three days. Hungry? The disciples said to him, where, where, where would we get so many loaves of desolate place so satisfied with such great multitude? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? <laughs> they said, seven. And a few small fish. He directed the multitude to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and the fish, giving them thanks. He broke them and started giving them to the disciples. And the disciples in turn to the multitudes. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up seven large baskets full. And those who ate were 4,000 men besides the women and children. And sending away the multitude, he got in the boat and came to the region of Magdan. Magdan. Magadan. And uh, so these were Gentiles we fed? Seems to be. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I can't guarantee there wasn't some Jews in, in there, but the, it seems to be directed mostly to the Gentile area. Uh, people. And the Jewish reaction and the Pharisees and um, um, in 16 here comes the uh, the clincher for me in all of this and the Pharisees and Sadducees came up testing him that's the first time we've heard that ever. Not, the, not the last uh, to show them a sign from heaven and he said to them when it's evening you say it will be fair, for the sky is red, and in the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the sign of the time? An evil and adulterous generation, which you just talked about in chapter 12, right? Seek for a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. And the disciples came to him on the other side and had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're thinking of food, right? Mm -hmm. And they began to discuss among themselves, it, it is because we took no bread. <laughs> but Jesus, aware of this, you men of, there it is again, little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread. Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand of how many baskets you took up? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand how many baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? 
but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not say to be aware of the bread, leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, we come to this important section where uh, we have rejection, but also a statement about the church. Uh, the attack by the Pharisees we just read, right? In verses 1 through 12. Now in verse 13, um, he begins to teach uh, his disciples. He's kind of leaving the multitudes and mostly dealing with his disciples. Now when Jesus came into the districts of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they say, said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Well, give me this hearsay, right? Who do you say? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Now notice what Jesus says to that statement. Mm -hmm. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, yeah, that's the only way you're going to understand. And then he makes this unbelievable statement, and I say to you that you are Patras, and upon this Patra, I will build my church. Now, you were reading English, right? And I was using Greek words to help you to understand the play on words for which Jesus is using. The Patras is a little rock, and the Patra is a large rock. I will build my church my ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not overpower. I, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and uh, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. I guess I need to translate this for you a little differently. First of all, this is a controversial statement about uh, what it really means. Uh, in verses 17 and 18, uh, you are Petros, upon your Petros will build your church. What? On Peter? No. And that's what the Roman church would tell you. Uh, the Roman Catholic church it takes this, and Peter, yeah, Peter is saying it, but it's not Peter. I, I would take it, it is the, the confession of Peter. Yes. This rock is Christ himself revealed in Peter's confession. Yes. That's what he is. Peter's a Petros, not the Petra. Come on. Okay? Mm -hmm. So upon the Petros' statement, the Petra will build his church. Okay? That's what it is. The, the rock uh, upon that confession that Peter just made is how I will build my church. He said he will give the keys of the kingdom to him. And, uh, and then he makes this statement. Um, and let's see if I put it in my notes. Yeah. Can we look back at uh, 18 before we go too far in the show? Sure. Uh, in the gates of uh, my interpretation is Hades will not overcome it. Yes. Is that death will not overcome well, it's, it, every unbelieving uh, dead, when he dies, goes to Hades. It's a, you want to call it a holding tank. Of, it's, it, is, it is judgment, and it's, uh, but it's not the final judgment. They are now in, um, you remember the parable when we get to Luke 16 of Lazarus the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man is in Hades. 
and there's a great gulf that separates them that you can't go to either side because the poor man went to Abraham's bosom to, to paradise. And so therefore Hades is a tormenting holding tank of all unbelieving dead that according to Revelation will be resurrected at the end of the millennium called the white throne judgment and they will be judged and then finally placed into the lake of fire for the, for eternity. So does not the scripture say Jesus died and went to Hades and preached? Well there's many uh, slippery uh, understandings of that. Um, I think Jesus in 1 Peter did make a proclamation when he died, but he didn't preach the gospel. He was preaching their judgment and his triumph over them. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. We see that from Colossians I, I, as well never, as 1 Peter. Yeah, since you said that, I've never seen the, where I say he preached the gospel. He just simply said he preached. Well, a lot of people think that you know, as a second chance to turn theology, which is incorrect and unbiblical. The only proclamation that I believe he made was that I have, I have overcome death and you guys, and uh, I'm making a triumph over you. Yeah, because if he's preaching the gospel and you're in Hades, you, I, I'd want to get out. I mean, yeah, you'd want to take saved. the gospel. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So it's not the Hades yeah. that I think he made this proclamation. He made it to the angelic host. A demonic yes. angelic host. That is talked about in Colossians chapter 2. Yeah. Come on, prophet. What's that? You're <laughs> getting excited over here. You're getting excited over here. Well, good. I'm glad you're getting excited. Praise God, right? No, he's a better. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, does that help Hades, knowing that it's a, basically a holding tank? Uh, and uh, I will give you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you... Uh, notice the translation that I put up here. Um, you know, it's always difficult when you don't know Greek for somebody to throw Greek on you, but this I have to use. This is a, an interesting um, construction of what is called a future prayer fasting perfect. I know now that just made your day, right? Yeah. But whatever you think about it, it should be translated. It's very awkward the way I'm going to translate it, but when I translate it that way, it makes a difference in how you understand it. Because I'm trying to bring out the future, future prayer fasting, the construction of the verbs here. What you shall bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. In other words, what you now speak, what is bound, is because what has already been stated is going to happen. So what I'm doing is I'm not making anything happen. I'm just telling you what has already been bound. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Okay? It's not that I now, Peter, am going to make these statements. I'm just telling you what has already been bound in heaven. God okay? okay, so... What you shall bind on earth shall have been already bound in heaven. Come on. Wow. And whatever you shall loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. In other words, I'm not, I'm not proclaiming See? anything except what heaven tells me to proclaim. <laughs> and what's been bound or not bound. Come on. Okay? I just have the privilege of, of proclaiming. There we go. Yeah, there so we go. The, the idea was, on the other hand, that's... Somehow Peter had the authority to just do whatever. Yeah. He decided. Not so. Nope. Yeah. Sorry, it's out. And it, 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 that kind of a translation is very awkward, but it gives you the correct understanding, and the, and the other ones in the text don't. All right. Reuben? I hate to get off the subject there, but back to Hades for a second. Yes, sir. Is that where the Roman Catholic Church gets purgatory from? Um. I, I'm not uh, a, a scholar on Roman Catholicism, so I don't know for sure, but usually they take uh, purgatory from um, Second Maccabees. Uh, yeah, Second Maccabees, which is in their, um, their Bible, which is not in ours because we don't believe it's 
Apocrypha has never been accepted mm -hmm. by the church or Judaism as part of the canon of scripture. Mm -hmm. So they don't they don't take anything from our Bible to state uh, anything about purpose? There, there is no such thing. Right. Thank you. Yeah. But if you read Second Maccabees, you will. Does it is it important to know what the canon of scripture is? Yeah. Sure is. Now when Jesus made that statement about Hades, yes. second man he at 12. the gate. Second man he's twelve. Wasn't he at the uh, supposed gate of hell? He could burn him? No. Uh, uh, Greek mythology. Okay, I'm not sure of where you where you are now. When well, could you when when the record is Hades, uh, Okay. Is, is that where, when Jesus said that statement, when they supposedly at the gates of hell, uh, in Capernaum, they believe that a certain mountain was the gate to, to Hades. Yeah, I don't know that. Where did, I mean, where did you get that? I didn't know. I, I haven't I read that. Arnold Brookenbaum. Oh, Arnold Brookenbaum. Yeah. Uh, you got me on that one. I mean, I... Uh, I have to I have to study it myself. I don't know. Let's call him but, Arnold. <laughs> uh, the gates of hell will not. Um, uh, you can't, they can't, you can't keep you from going through them. You know. Yeah. You know this. Gates don't move. Mm -hmm. We move. In other words. We don't have, you know, we, we need to be going through gates. <laughs> <laughs> and the gates of hell are not the way up to you. Well, okay, gates don't move. We, go, we move through gates. So by the power of God, we move through gates. <coughs> of the that's, why, that's why the ministry is full of problems, full of wars and battles. Because we're we're entering into the enemy's territory and taking, taking things. Okay. Only by the power of the Spirit. It's not because of us, right? Amen. So we have a testimony here, greatly put forth, and we um, don't have time to get on what I'll, I'll do, but I'll set it up since we've already. Uh, uh, started it uh, and stated it and, and mentioned it already that we have at the end of chapter 16 a setup for chapter 17 and that is that um, he speaks about uh, there are some who will who were standing with him that would not die until they saw the kingdom of God mm. now you remember uh he didn't say the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He says they'll just see it. And this, you know, we really didn't have to have this, but it is nice to know that Peter, James, and John saw the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And it's what I call mini cosmic viewpoint from the Mount of all, I mean the Mount of Transfiguration. So that they can come back and say, hey, the kingdom of God is, this is what I just love. The kingdom of God is not just spiritual. It is a realm. It's a place. I got to see part of it just for a moment. The Mount of Transfiguration. It's, it wasn't just spiritual. It was some people that were physically there. So, there, and that's what is yet to come. And when, next time, next week, we will uh, begin in chapter 17. We'll take you to 1 Peter and we'll try to continue to plow through and hopefully finish uh, coming up here at the book of Matthew so we can start Mark in a couple of weeks, right? All right. Any questions thus far? I know some things I've had to leave out, but we've got to keep moving and we'll never get through Matthew. <laughs> I still got Mark, Luke, my, uh, Luke and John, right? Mm hmm. Much here. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful uh, gospel of Matthew and how you 
helped us to see the beauty of bringing forth what you have promised both in the old and now in the new about your kingdom, about your people, about your son who is Messiah and what he has done for us and what he will do for us in the future. We rejoice with you, God. Make us men and women with eyes and ears that hear and obey by the power of the Spirit that which you teach, that we may be true witnesses of you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.